Welcome to A Walk in My Stilettos, where our goal is to help you walk in your greatness. I'm your host, McKinney Smith. Hey, Faith Walkers. Thank you for joining us today on the A Walk in My Stilettos podcast, where we have conversations with amazing women that are letting us step into their shoes. I get inspired when I see another woman succeeding, but as a mindset coach, what inspires me more is her backstory and her mindset on how she got there. So today's guest is about to bless us with her testimony, and since you're already here, you may as well subscribe. Today we have Nadia Theodore. She's a mother, a wife, and the Consul General of Canada in Atlanta with accreditation for Alabama, Georgia, Mississippi, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Tennessee. As Council General, Nadia is the Government of Canada's senior diplomat in the Southeast USA. Nadia has served as Chief of Staff and Executive Director to Toronto's Deputy Minister of International Trade. She's also served at Canada's Permanent Mission to the World Trade Organization and at Canada's Permanent Mission to the United Nations in Geneva and Switzerland. And Nadia is currently the only Black female and one of only few to ever head a Canadian diplomatic mission. Please welcome to the show, Nadia Theodore. Hi. Hi. Thank you. you. I'm good. Just, good. I just wanted to thank you so much for agreeing to come on and share your story with us. I'm absolutely honored. Oh, I'm I'm very happy to be here. And I have to apologize because I'm going to start off by making a small correction on behalf of my Ottawa peeps. So in the intro, you said that I served as to Toronto's deputy minister, but in fact, it was Canada's deputy minister in Ottawa. I know that okay. many people in Canada love to shout out Toronto, and I know that you have a fondness for Toronto, so I will... <laughs> <laughs> but, but I have to say that I actually worked um, for the Federal Deputy Minister of International Trade in Ottawa, born and okay. raised in Ottawa. Thank you for that correction. I like to start the show with an icebreaker question because I feel like as women, we have all these different titles that we go by, but a title that I feel doesn't get enough recognition is our name because our names have meaning. My first question to you, Nadia, is that, do you know what your name means? I do. And because I actually listened to this podcast, (laughs) I knew that you were going to ask me this question. (laughs) So I knew one definition of it. And it just goes to show when you do your research, the things Mm. that you can find out, right? So I knew that my name, Nadia, was of Bulgarian and Russian origin. That I already knew. Mm -hmm. And I knew that in Russian, it means hope. And I also knew that it was widely used in Arabic speaking countries and communities. And in Arabic, it means tender and delicate. Mm. But then I Googled it. I decided to Google it just to make sure that I hadn't forgotten what I thought I knew. And I found, interestingly enough, because you know, it is now 2019 and there's also a lot of fun stuff on the internet. I found a definition in the Urban Dictionary um, (laughs) for my name, (laughs) which I actually love above all the other definitions. It describes me, I think, pretty well. So Nadia will be one of the funniest, craziest, most loving people you will ever meet. But don't get on her bad side because she is not afraid to tell you out in front of everybody. (laughs) She protects her friends like they are her blood. (laughs) Wow. So I I like that. I like that. I thought, yeah, that's the definition that I'm going to claim from now on. (laughs) I love it. I love it. So every time someone says your name, that's what they're claiming. So own it. Exactly. Forget (laughs) delicate. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. (laughs) Take us back to the very beginning. What did Nadia want to be when she was a little girl? So, like I said, I was born and raised in Ottawa, Ontario, to two parents who immigrated to Canada when they were teenagers. Mm -hmm. Both of them were born and raised in St. Lucia. Mm -hmm. a small island in the Caribbean. And so growing up, I knew from a very early age that what I might want to be and what I was, quote unquote, allowed to be coming from, you know, West Indian immigrant parents Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm -hmm. were two completely different things. So I wanted to be a teacher, which was okay. I mean, my mom was a teacher, so that was that was okay. And then later on, I wanted to be a writer, which was a big no-no. I quickly was told that that was not going to be something that I was going to do. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) (laughs) uh, And then later on, I wanted to do sociology and criminology. 
Mm. Uh, and I remember my dad telling me that there will be no ologies. You can't do oh. any of the ologies. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> he will either be a lawyer or a doctor or an engineer. And that was kind of the choice. Well, you know, I mean, immigrant parents, right? They feel like they sacrificed everything and they wanted me to do something that was guaranteed a job. And they didn't really understand what a sociologist would do to earn money in life. Fair enough. So I never actually had one thing that I wanted to be when I was small and growing up. I had lots of ideas of what would be fun in the world. But when I think about it now, everything that I aspired to be had a sort of common thread. And that was helping people and being kind of out in the world, present every day, doing something that felt good. And that was actually making a difference in the world. I guess that's the common thread looking back at it now. All of my ideas of what I could be when I was an adult. I always find it interesting, especially for first generation Canadians, because our parents have a completely different mindset. And like you said, they have influence. They had a lot of say in what they wanted you to be growing up. I guess my question to you is, do you have those same beliefs with your children? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> do I have those same beliefs? With, I think the right answer to that is no, of course not. She can be whatever she wants. <laughs> right? I think that's the right answer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, I think, listen, I think if we're honest with ourselves, I think there are very few parents who don't find it difficult to hold dreams in their hearts for their children. But I do think that, and it has to do with privilege, right? I mean, I am now somebody who has a very good job, who makes a very good living, who's comfortable in their skin. And so all of those things contribute to being able to be a little bit more relaxed in terms of the vision that I have for my daughter in my heart, right? So right. I want her to absolutely grow up and have a job. Um, <laughs> I would like her, I would like her to have a job where she is able to support herself um, and to feel happy and to know that she is contributing to society and to her family, whatever that family looks like. But I don't have a certain profession like my parents did, right? right they wanted me to right. be, my dad especially, a lawyer, a doctor, an engineer, you know, a profession. That, I had the privilege of not having the weight of that. And my daughter's father, my husband, would say, in fact, that he would be very happy if she lives in our house for the rest of his life, for the rest of her life. <laughs> Daddy's uh, a girl. Be, right? right. Yeah, right. exactly. Which is very different than how I grew up or any of my siblings grew up, regardless of whether we were daddy's little girls or not, right? So that comes with a certain degree of privilege, obviously. Right. I, and I recognize that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, for sure. Like I, I look at a lot of women today who, especially the ones who come to me for coaching, where they're in professions where they're not happy, they're not feeling fulfilled, but it's because they're doing something that they were told to do, not something that they actually desired to do. But I love yeah. how you said, you know, you want your children to be able to make a living, to take care of themselves, to serve, to do good things, but you haven't put a specific title of a profession on them so they still have that yeah. freedom to do what they're yeah. passionate about just exactly. falling into you know being a good person I love that I love that so share with us how your journey began and how you became Consul General of Canada in Atlanta you know can I just say something this is the question that I dislike the most <laughs> I have realized <laughs> so I, and I say this I preface my answer as an apology to your listeners, because mm -hmm. I have realized that I am no good at telling my own story. I can tell somebody else's story. I can sell Canada. I can, <laughs> you know, <laughs> sell any sort of diplomatic advocacy issue that you need me to do it. But when I need to sell myself, it's not, it's not so good. So, so how I got here, I finished high school and went to university. I did go to law school as was requested. <laughs> and and um, finished law school and realized after law school that I will realize after law school, I knew that I knew before. Surprise, surprise, I didn't want to be a lawyer. And so I came back home and joined the federal public service because I, I now I know of myself that I'm not really a risk taker. Um, mm. And so working for the government was at the time what I thought would be a very safe job, <laughs> a safe place to be, nine to five, you know, I get a paycheck every two weeks, zero, zero risk. 
being a diplomat is a little bit different. So, you know, I've, I've clearly evolved, but, <laughs> but at the time, that's, that's what I thought. And then after a few years, I was working at uh, the Canadian Revenue Agency and I went back and did my master's because I knew that I sort of had a passion for international relations and especially trade uh, and trade policy. So I went to do my master's in that. Mm -hmm. And and then moved along in my career in the federal public service. So I worked for a couple of years at what was then called the Solicitor General's Office, which is now called Public Safety Canada. And while there, I, uh, like every other good public servant, saw an advertisement for what we call a competition in government speak, so an advertisement for a job. And it was to join what is now known to be Global Affairs Canada. At the time, it was called the Department of Foreign Affairs and International Trade, and mm -hmm. it was a position to be a trade negotiator. And I thought at the time I was working negotiating Aboriginal policing agreements for the Solicitor General's office. And I thought, well, this is interesting because it combines my master's degree in trade policy and in uh, an administration and political science. And then it's also sort of building on my negotiation experience that I've gotten. And so mm -hmm. I applied. And at the time, I didn't think I was going to be successful at all. Because at the time, the way that it worked in the government was when you applied for a position, they get thousands of applicants, as we all know. Mm -hmm. And then they interview however many people they interview. You do a written test. And then I had an interview with a panel of six people. And then I had another interview with another panel of five people. And then at the time, the way that it worked was that they ranked all of the candidates. So everybody that wrote the test got an actual score. Mm -hmm. So you either got like whatever, 80, 80 out of 100, 70 out of 100, whatever. And the person who got the highest score had to be offered the position first before they got to the person that got, you know, the second or the third highest right. and then down the list, right? Right, seniority, um, yeah. And they only had, they had two positions that they were hiring for out of this competition, out of this job advertisement. And I thought, well, there's no way. I mean, this is just ridiculous. I come to find out, I mean, I, did, I was successful, so I was the <laughs> highest scoring of everybody um, <laughs> that wrote the test. And then come to find out later that I was actually the only person that scored high enough to be ranked that didn't already work in the department. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, and I tell that story sometimes just to say to people, you know, you never know. Because I remember when I saw the advertisement and somebody had flagged it to me and said, hey, Nadia, you know, have you ever thought of joining the Foreign Service? You should apply for this. This looks great. And I thought to myself, I'm not going to apply for this. This is foreign affairs. Nobody ever gets in. They're, they've got a department full of people that I'm sure people are going to apply from within the department. And there's not a chance. So why would mm -hmm. I waste my time? Right. Because for your listeners, anybody who's ever applied for a government job knows that it is a lengthy, tedious, time-consuming process. <laughs> right. But it's an important lesson that you just, you never really know. And if something comes your way, crosses your desk or crosses your path that you think you want, you got to go for it. And you just got to give her um, Definitely. And, and, and be committed to it, right? Because you just never know how things turn out. Wow. So there's like three things that I, I took from that that I want to touch on. One, you're living in Atlanta. I'm sure you've definitely heard this when someone says like, you're the goat, like you're the greatest of all yeah. time. Like yeah, <laughs> you are that. the best. Like you're not <laughs> bragging when you say that you, you had the highest score. You had, you're the best. So uh, you could, no one can dispute that. Like <laughs> you can own that. Exactly. That I wanted I was, to speak I to. I was the best at that moment in time, yeah. <laughs> so for someone who said they don't know how to tell their own story, like just start with that. Say, you know what? I'm number one. Yeah, I'm maybe. Yeah. I'm a goat. <laughs> That's, That's good. good, actually. The, the, the second thing I wanted to touch on is when, you know, you spoke about it being hard to get into the government and, you know, you never know, you know, you were shocked. I had a guest on episode, I believe it was 56. Her name's Tazia Brown, and she's currently 
think she's a national communications strategist for Canada's largest federal public yes. sector union. She's yes, amazing. Yes, yes. She's but amazing. She, I listened to that one. She's yes, and she talked about she was waiting tables next door to this the government building, and now she's working in the government building and working for behalf of the people. Like you never know if That's you don't right. try. And That's then right. speaking of you never know if you don't try. There was a guest, uh, Vivian K. I'm sure you know who Vivian yes. K. Is. Okay, so she's absolutely for her. I was just introduced to her online like a few months ago. I don't. I've never met her in person, but she is. She, oh my topic. gosh, her. She's a ball of energy. She's a ball of sunshine. She is just a beautiful person. I had her on the first five interviews that I did for this podcast. Ah, but awesome. um, she has a, a saying where she says, "What would Chad do?" And okay, <laughs> that's Chad. become exactly that's become part of her talk <laughs> because as women of color, we don't go after certain opportunities because we don't think that we're going to be able to get them. But Chad yeah. is that yeah. overconfident white male that okay. goes after opportunities Chad whether or not is. he feels he's suitable okay. for or he has the credentials for but he goes after it and he gets it because he I tried it. so exactly when you're not sure just ask what would chad do <laughs> i love it chad is a male <laughs> i like that all right yeah <laughs> yes so that leads me to my next question for you because how do you feel being one of the few women of color canadian diplomats i feel very proud Actually, I feel, I feel proud. I now, two years in, feel a little bit more fierce about it and on, and apologetic about it mm. than I did at the beginning, I will say. At the beginning, coming in, I definitely felt, and still do, feel a very big sense of responsibility to be, and I think many women of color, but especially black women, I think that are in any sort of position, but in, in particular, a position that is high profile and a little bit outward public facing, you feel an obligation to be perfect, to be the very, very best that anybody has ever seen ever in the world at, at everything that you do. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, less people think that you were there only because of the color of your skin. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that is a weight that when you are also dealing with a new country, I'd never lived in the United States before, I had never visited the South before, dealing with new files, dealing with a new team. So I am the head of an office here of 25 people, some of which are American, some of which are Canadian. So dealing with that cross-cultural piece as well, because mm -hmm. we are indeed two different countries. Um, mm -hmm. So um, <laughs> there are indeed cross-cultural elements that are real. Uh, all of that is a lot. And then to layer on that, the weight of being the best that you can be, not just because you want to do your best, but because you actually feel that this is the chance. And if you mess it up, then you will forever be known as the black girl that they gave a chance to that messed up, right? And then, mm. and then you also feel the weight of bringing up people behind you and wanting to do the very best job so that the, the powers that be will hire another black woman to do something fantastic, right? Right, um, right. So I think that there's a lot of weight to that. That can really be difficult. And if you're not careful, can eat away at you in a way that is not positive at all. Mm. Because number one, nobody is perfect. Right. Uh, and, and so trying to be is guaranteed failure. And number two, what I realized after about, it took me almost a year, I would say, that you know, the people who are going to want to see you succeed mm -hmm. won't care if you make a mistake or if you fail. And in fact, they will welcome it because it's failure and, and falling down means growth. And they yes. will be there to pick you back up and to coach you and to help you along the way. And then the rest of the people will be the rest of the people regardless, <laughs> regardless <laughs> of whether you are fantastic, whether you're the goat or not. The, yeah, the rest yeah. of the people, the people who are waiting for you to fail, will find a failure regardless of whether regardless. you're doing, yeah, regardless of whether you're doing way better than anybody else has ever done it, they will find a reason why you are not the <laughs> GOAT. So you can't worry about them. You can't no, worry about you can't. Them. You right? cannot. You really, yeah, and you really have to, and the other thing, powerful thing that I have learned over the past two years especially is that it is a very important to take feedback from people who are on your team. Yes. Because everybody has an opinion. The peanut gallery is packed jam full 
<laughs> you know, there's almost no more space in the PETA gallery, you know? Yeah. So you can't take feedback from those people. You, re- you really can't. You have to find the people who are on your team, the people who are committed to your success, the people who will give you feedback, not out of ego, but out of true commitment to seeing you grow and do better and be better. Yeah. And, and, the, and keep those people close to you. And especially for women of color, especially for black women, I think that those sometimes are hard to find Mm -hmm. and few and far between, but they do exist and I have found them and it's been wonderful. Wow. I love that. Okay. So, well, one, it makes me actually think of, I'm going to say how opposite yet how the same you and I actually are because uh, (laughs) (laughs) I've been an entrepreneur for 10 years now. And for almost five years before that, I was a stay-at-home mom. So I am a risk taker. Yeah. I feel like in terms of... so good. I've tried working for the government. Uh, I'm not sure if you're aware, but I ran in the 2018 um, provincial election. Yeah. And that was completely out of my comfort zone. Completely out of my comfort zone. And that made me realize that you have a special superpower that I have to definitely take my hat off to you for. (laughs) (laughs) And um, also within that whole experience, what you said about taking advice and feedback from your team and not listening to the peanut gallery. Mm -hmm. I think that's huge because as tiny as my team was Mm -hmm. and as not diverse because my team, so one in itself, the area, Oshawa, that I was running in is not very, I'm going to say multicultural and diverse. Okay. And my volunteers and my team were mainly white. And I had a few people of color. Uh, if I recall correctly, I only can think of one black woman that comes to mind. But the support and feedback from them was crucial in order for me to even survive (laughs) running for that campaign and the the peanut gallery picked fault with my name they picked fault with what side of Oshawa I actually lived on or how far from the boundary line or the sign that says welcome to Oshawa I actually live in like the things that they would nitpick at I'm thinking to myself someone who genuinely wants to help someone who genuinely wants to serve and The negativity that comes from people that want to see you fail is just ridiculous. So I... I mean, it's real. Absolutely. Yeah. So I definitely tip my hat to you on that one. Thank you. (laughs) So share with us one thing that most people don't know about Nadia. Well, I think that most people might not realize... I'm going to use the word shy. Maybe shy is not the right word, but that I'm not actually the 100% extrovert that I think comes across when people meet me. Right. Uh, I think most people think that I'm a people lover and an extrovert and the life of the party and, you know, somebody that knows everything and wants to know everything and be in the mix and all that. Mm -hmm. And I'm actually quite, I do love people. Don't get me wrong. I definitely (laughs) love people. I love being around people. I do get, you know, a lot of my energy from meeting people, meeting different types of people, which is why I think this is the perfect job for me. I love to talk to people who have differing views than I do. It gives me the most joy, actually. So I do like people, but I am not good with crowds. (laughs) I do not enjoy small talk. I do not enjoy talking to people that I have no, that, you know, just for chit-chatting. I'm not not good at that. And and at the end of the day, this job in particular, because it's so outward-facing, at the end of the day, I am drained. I need to go home and curl up in my bed with my book because mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. I am I'm a little bit of an introvert that way. Like I, too much of people gets me a little bit, you know, it drains me. So I do, yep. I do need my me time. And, and that was something that I don't think people realize. And especially in this job, first few months when you're learning all these different things and these new things, and I had to read up and learn about the Southeast USA real quick. I would, I would often be in my office with my door closed reading. I'm also very cerebral. I love policy and I, and I read a lot and I love to dig deep into an issue. And I think that people thought, oh, who's this lady who seems so friendly on the outside, but then she goes to the office and closes the door. Like, yeah, she's not very open. <laughs> I mean, uh, but that wasn't it at all. It was really just that I needed time 
to digest things and to really, you know, learn about the job and the role and my place in the role. And so I definitely need my me time. And I don't think, I think that I come across as being very extroverted and to a certain extent I am, but I'm also pretty introverted. It sounds like you're an ambivert, which is like a split because. Oh, what's that? Yeah, that's what I am. Yes. (laughs) Ambivert. (laughs) <laughs> yes, ambivert. Because I'm so introverted and I let people know that I'm definitely working on that. Because like you said, when you're in the public, people assume that you're extroverted because they see you out there. They see you socializing, going to network events and doing things. They just automatically assume you have to be an extrovert. So when you say that you enjoy certain things and you get fueled by having conversations and meeting people, but you know they need to be deep conversations and you need to recharge to be alone, like you have a, a complete split of extrovert and introvert so that's called ambivert and for those listening who don't know someone who is extroverted they actually recharge being around other people they need to be out there and socializing introverts recharge with alone time we need to be alone to recharge and reset and sometimes being out and around too many people actually drains us because it's like sucking (laughs) the life out of us all of our energy so you yeah. sound like you're definitely an ambivert. Yes, that is me. I love that. Yeah. I'm an ambivert. I didn't All know right. that word and now I do and I love it. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I will also say, I have to say that, you know, coming up in the federal public service and especially at Global Affairs, I think that I also made an effort to always raise my hand, to always, you know, get to know people and talk to them and you know, volunteer myself for things because I knew, you know, we know as women and especially as women of color that we're not, we might not be the first person that somebody chooses for something, right? And that we might have to work, not might, we will have to work harder Harder. and longer than others to get the opportunities. So Mm -hmm. I was from the very beginning, that was not lost on me. My mother taught me well. So, Mm -hmm. so I think that that also fuels the perception of being an extrovert because Mm. absolutely I was the first person on the committee to do such and such or to you know raise my hand when they needed person to work extra hours to complete this file or there was something that nobody else wanted to do because it was tedious and I was always like I'll do it no problem Mm -hmm. so it gives people the perception that you are an extrovert and that you always want to be up in the mix but you know I, I definitely did that so that people would see my value and that and it gave people the opportunity to see my work as well. Yes. I don't recall. I think it was, there's a female motivational speaker. I think it was Mel, Mel Gibson. I can't remember her name right now, but she okay. talked about as women, when we go to meetings, because we're already considered a minority as a woman, and then you're a minority as a woman of color. When you go to meetings to make sure that you ask questions, to make sure that you sit in the middle of the table, not at the end so that they don't see you as the note taker. Exactly. Making sure that you're seen, noticed, and heard exactly. so that you're not dismissed for opportunities and so that you do get that chance that we actually have to work really hard for. Exactly. That might, is that, was that Mel Robbins? Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> I was awesome. trying to remember. <laughs> yeah. She's yes. awesome. That's exactly it. 100%. So, so I did that and that's part of what got me, what got me where I am. But I always have to remind myself to recharge and recharging mm-hmm. for me means being at home with my book. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. So what inspires you the most about what you do? I love these questions. I love that I did not have them in advance. (laughs) Like, I'm like, oh, that's a good question. Right now, I am sitting at my desk, Mm -hmm. and I am looking at the Canadian flag, the Georgia flag, the American flag, and then a big pop-up poster of Viola Desmond that just arrived from the Bank of Canada. Wow. The Bank of Canada pop-up. I should send you a picture. And we ordered them because we did a Black History Month event. We started a series called the Viola Desmond Lecture Series last year for Black History Month. Mm -hmm. And the Bank of Canada sent us these pop-ups. And I didn't want to send them back. (laughs) So so we bought them. And so now it's sitting in my office. And as I look at, so whenever I come into my office in the morning, that is what I am greeted with. And, you know, that inspires me. The fact that when, when it got dropped off, my communications person, uh, who's another black lady, said to me, well, look at you and Viola sitting here in this big office with these Canada <laughs> flags, this American flag, right? Look at you. Look at you. Who would have thunk it? Yes. Um, yeah, that inspires me. It inspires me that, you know, not long ago, my dad 
used to say, you know, he would come home and say that he was passed up for a manager position, not even a director position, a manager position. And he said, you know, at least my director was honest to me. And he said, you know, people aren't going to listen to you. You're, you know, a black man, like nobody, like we can't. Yeah. I mean, that wasn't so Mm -hmm. long ago, you know, my dad. Yeah. And here I am today. So that inspires me. And the fact that I get to do that, not sitting behind a desk in Ottawa, right? Mm -hmm. But Mm -hmm. I get to do that representing my country abroad out in the world. That inspires me. Absolutely. I love it. Yeah, Canada is not perfect. I am not saying that. I'm not trying to be Pollyanna about it, but Mm -hmm. um, but we're pretty darn good. Uh, Mm -hmm. And and I love and I love representing my country abroad. That that representation matters. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I love it. I love it. So can you speak to some of the adversities that you've had to experience to get to where you are today? Yeah, nothing any different than anybody else. So I listen to your podcast. Uh, a lot uh, because I think it's fantastic I've listened to several episodes no honestly I think it's fantastic and you know your listeners hopefully are are very loyal and have listened to to many episodes as well and so everything that everybody else has talked about in terms of adversity especially being a black woman in a professional setting has happened to me so I have absolutely had people as I walked into a room for a meeting that I was leading, uh, ask me for coffee. Um, mm. uh, you know, I have absolutely had people mistake me for the note taker, 100%. You know, I have had people come into my nice office here and say things like, not too long ago, this would have been my office and you would have been serving me coffee. Uh, oh, you know, wow. All, all, all of the oh. things. I mean, all of the things, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's not what? blatantly I, racist or anything yeah yeah <laughs> or sexist yeah or yeah exactly right you kind of think oh which one was that okay yeah Maybe both. A combination of both. <laughs> yeah yeah and you know so those are kind of the obvious things but what I think that we often and now we're talking about it a little bit more and we've got fun buzzwords for it but what I think has been most difficult, especially given my personality. I'm a middle child. And so I always aim to please and to smooth things over. And I like there to be peace. I like a good debate. Mm-hmm. but uh, and, and I am able to debate and then break bread after, right? To me, that's normal but I I realize that for others it's not and so that makes me uncomfortable <laughs> so I'm trying to be, always trying to make people comfortable you know trying to get people to see both sides of this coin and mm-hmm. you know middle child syndrome and so for me what's been more difficult are like the little jabs you know the oh wow you know you've done so well I'm really happy for you wow you've done wow I'm really oh, good for you you know mm-hmm. like yeah, okay, yeah, I've done, yeah, I've done, I have absolutely done well, but, you know, yeah. I've lost a lot of people, and, you know, you sound surprised, I'm not sure it, why, yeah. <laughs> right, or yeah. you've gone so far so quickly, wow, like, you, you didn't know, earn like, that, or you didn't work for that, well, like, and not that, not that quickly, no, no, actually, <laughs> you know, actually, a lot of my peer group that I came up with in, in the government are at the same stage that I'm at, so this is mm-hmm. normal, Maybe quickly, given your biases that you have of somebody that looks like me and where we right. be, maybe. Right. But no, not that quickly, actually. Like that, to me, is harder because I find that those types of things have the ability, if you are not careful, to chip away at your confidence. Right. Right? I mean, when somebody is blatantly rude, disrespectful, racist, or sexist, it is so easy to say, well, forget you. I mean, you're just a lost cause. Mm-hmm. Right? It's easy. But little things like people being surprised at where you are or constantly saying that, you know, you got here so quickly, that can chip away your confidence because it makes you feel like you are some, it can make you feel if you're not careful, like you don't belong where you are, right? Mm -hmm. And it can perpetuate the feeling of having to do more all the time and having to be perfect and which is, again, like we talked about before, not healthy. When I think about adversities, I I tend to more, and what I needed to overcome, to me, my biggest thing is is overcoming the the tendency that I had to give too much weight. The validation. Yeah, to what what everybody else thought. Right. Yeah, exactly, right? 
Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, like we talked about before, you know, you should take feedback from people who are on your team and you should really own your own power yes. uh, and own your own validation and get those from people who are on your team and in it for you and with you. Uh, yes. Because otherwise that could be, that, that can make it very, very difficult for you to grow and move forward. My mom used to say to me in high school, you know, be careful who you give your energy to because yes. not everybody wants you to succeed. Yes. And I, I feel like I should have that as a bumper sticker or something. Because <laughs> I, I try and live by it more than ever now. Very, very important. I totally, totally agree with you. I used to let the backhanded compliments get to me. And then yeah. I learned, you know, thank God for personal development, where I had yeah. to actually learn that when people say stuff like that, it's because of their own limiting beliefs of what they yeah. believe is possible for them why they don't exactly. understand why you've been able to multiply your results and get to where you are because they, exactly. they didn't see the way that you did it as possible, or they didn't see how you were able to get there. They have no idea what you had to do to get there. Yep. They have exactly. no idea what you're even capable of, but because of their own limitations, they're like, Oh, how'd you get there so quick? It's like, <laughs> That's exactly. That's exactly yeah. right. You're 100% yeah. right. If yeah. you don't, if you haven't done that personal growth, then you take it personally, right? And it starts mm -hmm. to kind of play with your own, with your headspace. Yes. So whenever, whenever I think about adversity, and especially when I'm talking to young women, and especially young women of color, I always want to talk about those little comments, those adversities that are a little bit less obvious, because I feel like that more and more, especially with social media, and, you know, mm -hmm. everybody apparently is your friend mm -hmm. and, you know, you get <laughs> however many likes and apparently that means that everybody's supporting you. Well, yeah, no, actually. no, it doesn't. Um, yeah. So let's not get it twisted, right? Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> so those things to me are just as important, not more important, but just as important in terms of adversity and talking about what you need to overcome in today's world to make it and be who you want to be than some of the more obvious things, which, of course, I have dealt with as well, but. I think it's important to talk about the less obvious and the more nuanced uh, things. Yeah, I think to speak to what your mom said about careful who you give your energy to, because people who make those backhanded compliments, they're planting a seed. And like you said, if your self-confidence isn't where you would like it to be, that seed actually subconsciously, you start to water that seed. And you yeah. start to doubt yourself and you have this negative self-talk. And then before you know it, you're self-sabotaging your own right. opportunities because of some bad seed that somebody planted in you without exactly. good intention. Exactly. Yeah. 100%. 100%. Yeah. So have you had any coaches or mentors that have helped you along the way? Yes, absolutely. 100%. So I have had very good mentors. I am very lucky in my career. Kirsten Hillman, who is now serving as our ambassador to the United States in Washington, so I worked for her for several years and she has been a mentor and frankly has become a friend but started off as a mentor to me and really taught me to prepare, to do my homework, to really understand where it is that I wanted to go, either on a file or in my broader career, and then to make a plan and then execute. You know, mm -hmm. she is a lawyer by trade, and she is a very disciplined, cerebral, thoughtful person. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I continue to learn a lot about her from a work perspective on how to really succeed. Like, what do you actually have to do? You know, like platitudes mm -hmm. are great, and one-liners are wonderful, and all the motivational speak speeches mm -hmm. in the world are fantastic. But you also need the actual tools. You know, you need somebody to actually to tell you, okay, when you are working on a file, you need to do the research, you need to talk to these people, you need to, right, like the actual yeah, yeah. concrete yeah. advice. What's so the strategies? Been, yeah. Yeah. What's the strategy? So she's been wonderful at that and in giving me hard feedback. So that's been really, really good. So I'm lucky to have her. And then, you know, there have been other women, mostly women in my career who have given me opportunities, not always women, but mostly, um, who have given me opportunities that I otherwise wouldn't have had. I am here as Consul General because my boss, who was at the time the Deputy Minister of International Trade, Christine Hogan, um, she's now the Deputy Minister of Environment and Climate Change. When I went to go work for her as the, her Chief of Staff, she said to me, 
you need to go abroad. You need to be a head of mission, whether that's a consul general, an ambassador, or a high commissioner. So we need to plan for that because that's Mm -hmm. what you're going to do. And I said, oh, I don't think I can do that. And she said, oh, yeah, I think you are going to do it. So let's let's get ready. (laughs) I love it when those who genuinely love and and care for us, they see more for us than we see in ourselves sometimes. And they're able to push us (laughs) in that direction. (laughs) She was like, "Mm, yeah, I think you can do it. Absolutely. (laughs) <laughs> and then she laughed and she was posted to the World Bank as Canada's representative at the World Bank in D.C. And then a new deputy minister came in, Tim Sargent, who was equally as fantastic. I mean, I have been very lucky to have very good people that I reported to because he said the same thing. You know, he was like, oh, yeah, don't, yeah, you're, you're going to be doing that. And I was like, oh, I don't know. I kind of like, I like it here. You know, I like, I like working for you. This is great. He's like, no, yeah, you're going to be going out. So you, we need to prepare for that. Figure out where you want to go. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it helped guide you. Uh, it helped guide you. Yeah, and helped push me. Forget about yeah. guiding. I mean, yeah. it really helped you to, as Minda Hartz would say, if everybody has not heard of Minda Hartz and bought in the book, The Memo, You Should, available on Amazon. She's amazing. And as she would say, you just need to jump off the cliff. Yep. And sometimes when you're too scared to jump, you need somebody who's going to push you. Push. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and so I have been lucky to have people to have people who are going to push me, who push me. And even when I came here, like I said, the first year was very difficult for me. I was letting a lot of negativity get to me. And it was Kirsten who said to me, you know, during a conversation, she said, you know, you're letting what is the best experience of your life be tainted by people in the peanut gallery. Mm. You know, I mean, so, you know, sometimes you need people to kind of either push you or to kind of hold up the mirror yeah. so that you can see yourself and what you're doing to yourself. Yep, to um, refocus. To help you change direction. Exactly. That's right. Yeah, to help you refocus 100%. So with everything that you do in your job and at home, how do you take care of Nadia? What's Nadia's self-care routine look like? Usually it's again in my bed with a book. I love my bed. <laughs> <laughs> Some people are couch people. I'm like in my bed under the covers with my book. <laughs> I feel book. you. Read it. Yeah, you know, in my comfy pajamas. <laughs> if I tell um, you right now I'm in my bed in my comfy pajamas, would you believe oh my, me? <laughs> yeah, I would believe you because that would be me. <laughs> That would absolutely be me. Yeah, because that's me. That's to me, that is self-care. And I feel no guilt on a Saturday to give my dear daughter the iPad and whatever cereal box that she mm-hmm. wants. <laughs> and so that I can be in my bed with my book. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. So I try, yeah, I try. I've got a lot of evening and weekend events, obviously, but Saturday day, I try to keep for me, especially because I'm traveling a lot. So when I'm not traveling, I try and be home in bed on a Saturday morning with my book. And then, I, and then I try and exercise. I mean, I'm, again, lucky and have the privilege of being able to afford a treadmill that, and, a, and a bike that I have at home. And so I could lie and say that I try and do that every day. But I try, <laughs> actually. It's not a lie to say that I try. I do try. It's you make an usually, effort. <laughs> yeah, usually I get on it, you know, three times a week. So that's good. So, so that also helps. <laughs> three times a week is track. great. It's pretty good, right? That is great. Be gentle with yourself. Absolutely. That is great. Exactly. That is way more than zero. Exactly. It is. It's three yes. times more than zero, in fact. Yeah, exactly. And so, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I try and do that. And that helps to clear your head. You know, I feel like moving and listening to music that you love. For me, I'm a big music lover. So for me, that really helps to, to clear my mind. Yeah. So I have this question that I like to ask every guest that comes on because I came across this article in Reader's Digest. And so far, it has been on point. So let's see. Yeah. But the article basically says that your favorite type of shoe says a lot about your personality. Yeah. So Nadia, my question to you is, what is your favorite type of shoe? Is it a high heel boot, a running shoe, a walking shoe, a flat, flip flop, a loafer, mule, wedge, pump? I don't know. What's your favorite type? Yes. So my favorite, if I had my druthers, I would be in a sneaker every day, all day. (laughs) Okay. Okay. Usually because of work, I have to wear 
something a little bit more professional. So I wear a flat, but I'm not a stiletto person. Sorry. I know that you are. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Almost never do I wear a heel. So if I had my pick, it would be a sneaker every day, all day. And in fact, I just celebrated a birthday and my birthday present to myself was a new pair of sneakers. Uh, Happy birthday. (laughs) Happy belated. thank Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So they say that sneaker buffs get along with everyone. You are, mm -hmm, you're sometimes, you're an old soul and sometimes you're the life of the party. For sneaker buffs, age truly is but a number because you get along with everyone. The sneaker is very versatile, a very open person willing to explore a lot of options and different ideas. They're energetic and ageless. They're really not young or old and they seem to move fluidly through age specific groups. Oh, I like that. Energetic and ageless. Uh, yep. Yes, please. Yeah, I'll yeah. <laughs> Sounds like you. I will say, yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Especially the ageless part. <laughs> love it. Love it. I'm taking that. I'm taking that. Yeah, the She's part, like, I'm, I'm going to take it and run I'm in my sneakers. I'm claiming that. Absolutely. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> it's, me. it's been accurate so far. So I like I'm, it. I'm going like to stick it. with it. Yeah, I like that. What what magazine was that? I'm going to go to. Um, it's that. a Reader's Digest article. I can send it to you. Reader's actually. Digest. Yeah, please. Yeah. Please. Yeah. Yeah. Send it to me. Yeah. It's cool. So before we go to the final segment, I want you to tell people where they can stay connected with you online. So I'm on Twitter. So my Twitter handle is Theodore, T H E O D O R E underscore Nadia. Mm-hmm. And I recently joined Instagram. I. Mm-hmm you know, entered the 21st century and my Twitter, <laughs> my, my Instagram handles, you call it a handle is yeah. uh, C G uh, as in consul general, C G Theodore on Instagram. And that's it. I'm not on Facebook. Okay. So and I will LinkedIn, make sure. And it's just my name on LinkedIn, Nadia Theodore. Love it. I will make yeah. sure to have the direct links in the detailed section of your episode so they can click and find you directly without awesome. any issues. Awesome. So for the final segment, I like to call it a walk in her wisdom. I finally decided on a name. And Ooh, like it's it. just <laughs> reflection questions <laughs> where you share inspiration from your walk. What new belief, behavior, or habit has improved your life in the last five years? The belief that I am good enough. Mm, yeah, that's a big definitely one. Definitely the belief, yeah. What advice would you give your younger self? I would remind myself of the advice that my mother tried to give me when I was younger that I refused to take on board until much later on. Be be careful who you (laughs) give your energy to. Mm. Not everybody. And the second part is the most important. Not everybody wants you to succeed. You know, not everybody is your friend and not everybody is on your team. And that is a fact of life. So be very careful who you give your energy to. As you were saying that just now, that really resonated with me because I actually had a mentee that I was giving all of my energy to and I knew Mm. that she'd struggled with some mental health issues but I didn't know the extent of it and Mm -hmm. as a mentee I'm giving her all the advice in the world putting her onto opportunities and then finding out on the back end the sabotage that is happening where she was not only destroying my name within the city but other women of influence that I'm connected to spreading lies and I'm thinking wow, we were pouring our energy into you, but you really yes. didn't want us to succeed. Like, I don't understand. Well, that's, so, uh, and it's hard. It's a hard lesson to learn, right? I mean, especially like you, your experience with people that aren't necessarily your peers or your superiors, but people who you are actually trying to help. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and you feel like you're doing your best by them and you're giving them a lot of energy and they're pretending that they're receiving it in a very authentic way, but not. And no. that's hard. That, mm-hmm. that, that is really hard. And I've had my fair share of that. And it, it can be very, very difficult. Yeah. Well, thanks to your mom, I now have that advice etched on yeah. the front of my my head. <laughs> exactly. We can t t-shirt. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you, Nadia, for taking the time to join us. I truly appreciate you sharing your gems with us today. Thank you. This was really fun. Good, good. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Yeah, it was awesome. It was awesome. Really, really good. Thank you. Thank you so much. And to all of you faith walkers out there, until next time, 
subscribe to our newsletter at walkinmystilettos.com and grab a copy of one of my personal development books available online everywhere. And if you've received value from today's show, please share it with a friend that needs to hear Nadia's testimony. Be sure to screenshot this week's episode and tag us on Instagram. Nadia is C G Theodore and I am at the real Mikini Smith and continue to walk in greatness in your stilettos in a manner worthy of your calling. I love it. Thanks, Bikini. Yay.